Opco, Holdco, or both? What is right for your business? I got a special guest today, Adam Buzz, Head of Wealth and Estate Planning. Adam, I wanna ask you this question. I'm gonna pretend I'm a business owner and I wanna ask, should I have an operating company? Should I have a holding company? And should I maybe have both? And should there be something else? So let's assume I own a very large business, multiple revenue streams, a lot of stuff, and I'm able to pull money out of that corporation. Uh, and I've always just had an operating company and it's, it's a large company. What would you say to that situation? Oh, that's a good question, Rob. Um, well, first off, I mean, we are not here necessarily to give you a tax or legal advice. We always wanna make sure that you chat with your accountant or coordinate with your accountant, your lawyer, with us. We're happy to join those conversations to make sure that all our, our heads are put together to find the right solution. But often, if you have a, a good problem, which is you're generating healthy profits in your company, you maybe don't want to leave all that cash inside your operating company. That could be for liability purposes, that could be for future saleability where you won't meet the lifetime capital gains exemption rules, because that's big, that's over $900,000 of, of tax-free money on the, on the sale of shares. So if you are offside in your company, AKA too passive asset heavy, too much cash, even though that's a good problem, you're gonna lose out on a lot of tax-free money. So now you have two options. How do I deal with this passive cash in my company? I can either take it out, pay it to myself personally, likely pay a boatload of tax resulting from ton that of immediately. Tax. Ton of tax. Maybe okay if you absolutely crucially need that money personally, but the more efficient manner is usually transferring that passive asset into a holding company. That also creates a separate legal entity that is owning that. The two are likely tied together, which is, which is normal, but it also creates a little bit of liability protection, and you're really saving that as a corporate piggy bank that you can draw off of in retirement to live off of. I might think that I'm never gonna need a hold go because I'm gonna keep this business forever, and I'm never gonna get sued, and that's crazy talk, and I just need the one, but in reality, what happens is things change over time, right? So now this operating company that I have, if I'm somehow liable for damages, and it's a significant judgment against me, five, 10 million or something, and I have that much cash in the operating company, I can lose that cash, whereby if that cash is sitting in a holding company, yes, maybe the business goes bankrupt, but at least I still got that five or 10 million sitting in the holding company. The other one I really like that you described is the capital gains exemption. So we talk about how important that is. We work so hard as entrepreneurs to build up companies and yet on sale, we're taxed, right? Like the government will want to get a portion of the capital gains back as taxes. If there's a spouse in there as well, that's two capital gains exemptions. Maybe there's a kid or two. You could have three or four capital gains exemption that could be offside if you keep too much cash, too much passive income, mm -hmm. too much passive assets in the operating company. So I like that you point that out. We want to avoid that. If we can save you, tax on a $900,000 cap gain times two or three or four, well, it would be crazy not to be giving you that advice. So I'm glad you brought that up. Now, it's a little more complicated, is it not, to have a holding company and an operating company? So aside from the cost and the filing annually, would those be, or would those be the kind of the two biggest uh, downsides of having these? these I, I would say that would be the, the obvious downside is, you know, okay, you have another corporation, you have to maintain, pay annual filing fees, pay accounting fees to use it, you know, maybe another bank account that you need to look at. It's essentially a cost of doing business, but are you getting more benefit out of it than what you're paying, which is the key that we want to look at. And often people do set up this structure but have no idea how to use it. Yeah, we see that a lot. Or they set it up prematurely. You don't have to do it from day one, right? You might start your company. I'm sure your company would have started small and grown over time. So you're gonna grow into that need at some point in time. Again, if it makes sense. Not every operating company will have a holding company. It's again, what makes the right sense for your particular situation and then we can go down the rabbit hole of, of trust and, and all those things. But again, that's what we do. That's what we want to look at. I'll give you another quick example. Let's, let's say go, you let's, go. let's say you have a business partner. Let's say uh, let's say Claude is your business partner. Okay, you each own uh, half of this operating company. There's healthy cash flow. Maybe Claude wants that healthy cash flow paid out personally. 
Maybe you don't, right? You can have the holding company, he can get his dividends uh, paid to himself personally, and you can have your dividends flow down to your holding company. That's the beauty of how it can be structured. So that again, each partner can kind of do their own things, but everything's still kept fair. If you have the operating company, you want to declare a dividend. If Claude needs the cash flow mm -hmm. and you want to declare that dividend, well, we own the same class of shares, so I have to declare a dividend also. And maybe I don't need the cash flow. Uh, maybe my lifestyle is less, or maybe he wants to take more trips. So that is a phenomenal example of one way where you can individualize the tax situation for each partner. If you have three, four, five partners. It just gets multiplied. It's multiple. Yeah. And you don't want to be put in a situation where you're declaring income for someone unless you absolutely have to. You don't want to pay tax unless you absolutely have to. If you can defer tax, you want to be able to defer that tax. That's a great example. To me, the big thing is always, if you're generating enough income that you're not spending it all, that's probably a good time to start considering mm -hmm. the operating company. And that's something that, you know, you could talk to your accountant about, you could talk to your advisor about, or heck, you can even go to www.speaktorom.com and book a no obligation consultation. This is what we do as well. Thanks for tuning in guys. Adam, Bus, Wealth and Estate Planning Specialist. Thanks for taking the time guys. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com. We'll see you in the next video.